Yes, hello everyone. Uh, as JB mentioned, uh, my research area is actually a combination of neuroscience and machine learning. And I am um, very much so uh, an enthusiast of deep learning. Uh, and I think that uh, deep learning has some uh, fantastic properties, both for doing machine learning generally and uh, actually for serving as a model for neuroscientists to use. Um, now, what I want to do today, though, is maybe something slightly different than some people might uh, expect from an introduction to deep learning lecture. So I'm not going to give you a tutorial on how to build deep neural networks for analyzing your data. Um, nor am I going to give you an explanation of the mathematics involved. Uh, the basic mathematics of it. The reason I'm not going to do that is because there are honestly thousands of resources online for that. And the specifics for how you build a network are going to depend on your specific application in a way that uh, I don't think I would actually best service your time or my time by doing that here. Um, I will say though, if you're interested in getting hands-on experience with these things, as I said, there's great resources, both online and in real life. Um, if you just want a chance to try coding up some deep neural networks, I recommend the PyTorch or the uh, TensorFlow tutorials. The PyTorch tutorials there, that, that's a link, FYI. So um, I sent my slides over and you should be able to follow that link through. Also, if you're interested in a more thorough review of the subject matter, um, there is a textbook written by uh, the experts, Ian Goodfellow, uh, Yashua Bengio, and Aaron Corville, uh, and I recommend that thoroughly as well. So that's not what this talk is going to be. But what it is going to be is that I want to give you a sense of what deep learning is actually good for and what it's not good for. And the reason I want to do that is I think although there is all this fantastic online material that you can use to learn how to program a deep neural network, what there rarely is, is an explanation for why deep learning was developed, why it is the way it is, and what it actually is good for. And what you often see, much to the chagrin of many people uh, and the Twitterati, as it were, is people just kind of throwing deep learning at any random problem. And it's so much so, in fact, that then when people like me who are really interested in deep learning's potential applications to neuroscience, say, you know, oh, look, here are these fantastic things we can do with deep learning and neuroscience. People are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're just following the hype train. That's the, that's the reaction I get sometimes. And I think it's precisely because there are many instances where people apply deep learning where it's not actually the right tool. And that's because people rarely get this bit of education that I'm about to give you today. So my hope is that what you're going to come away with from, from today's lecture is the wherewithal to, to, to know as a, as a scientist when deep learning is the right strategy for you to employ and when it's not. Okay, so we're gonna actually start with a theorem. Uh, so there is gonna be a little bit of math, but it's gonna be very high level math. Don't let it spook you if you don't fully understand some of the bits, like the actual math is easy. Some of the concepts are a bit tough, but if you don't fully understand it, it's not the end of the world. What I want to give you is a high level of concept. So hopefully you get the, the, the basic idea of what's going on. Um, but also for the record, feel free to ask questions as we're going and I will attend to them. Um, and JB is going to uh, look at the chat and if there's a good question, um, highlight it for me and I'll, I'll address it. Um, so this should be interactive by the way. So anyway, we're going to start with this theorem called the no free lunch theorem and talk about its implications for artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, and then we're going to talk about what it tells us about the need for something called inductive biases. And this is actually going to be the anchor by which uh, you should understand deep learning. So we're then going to talk about why deep architectures are potentially a good inductive bias to use in certain domains. And then we'll talk briefly about what is required to get deep architectures to work. Um, and once we've covered all this, we should be in a position to clarify very, you know, concretely for you, what are the situations and when you should, when you should use deep learning and when you shouldn't. Okay, so let's start with no free lunch. So the early dream of machine learning researchers was 
that we could build a general purpose learning algorithm that could be applied to any data set, any scenario. The hope was that, you know, we could take data of any kind, use computers to identify the patterns within that data and the rules that govern that data, and then extract from that um, information that we want in any particular domain. And the hope was that this could be done with, as I said, a general purpose algorithm so that you could have tools that worked in any scenario and you didn't need bespoke tools for different settings. I joke that this is like duct tape for AI. So in the way that you can kind of use duct tape to stick anything together, the hope was that uh, you would be able to uh, bring anything together within uh, AI using these general purpose machine learning algorithms. Um, I joke sometimes that neuroscientists still think of heavy and plasticity this way. Uh, though I guess this isn't a neuroscience course, so maybe that joke is not going to land. So I'll just move on. Um, anyway, it turns out that this dream of a general purpose learning algorithm is an impossibility. There exists no algorithm that can perform better than all other learning algorithms on all tasks. This is in fact a mathematical certainty. And the reason it is, is because of a theorem that was published in 1997 by Wolpert and McReady called the No Free Lunch Theorem for Optimization. That's the paper there um, that uh, this comes from. And uh, this uh, theorem basically crushed the hopes and dreams of the early machine learning researchers who wanted these general purpose tools. So here's what the theorem says. So I'm gonna tell you what the theorem actually says mathematically. It's not difficult in, an, in terms of the equation. Some of the concepts might be a bit tough. So let's, um, let's try to make sure that you understand it at a, at a high level. Okay, so any uh, machine learning algorithm is uh, applied to, when you apply it to a different task, what you're ultimately doing is you're deciding what the loss function is for that algorithm. So a loss function, in case you're unfamiliar with this concept, though hopefully you are aware of it by now, um, is a function that you use to quantify how poorly you are currently doing at the task at hand. So the higher your loss function, the worse you're doing. For example, um, let's say you're trying to train a machine learning system to categorize images into different categories. So dogs, cars, planes, apples, whatever. Your loss function in that case would probably measure the extent to which you miscategorize objects uh, from the different categories into incorrect categories. Um, similarly, if you're doing regression, for example, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, the loss function is the sum of squared errors. What you're doing when you're trying to figure out your regression model is minimize the sum of squared errors, and that is your loss function. So for any given task, we define a loss function, and this tells us what the task is effectively. Um, and we can view these loss functions as functions from data points, X. So we're going to receive some data, whether it's, you know, medical information or images or sound, whatever, as well as the uh, corresponding information required to know the performance. So if, say, you're trying to do a medical diagnostic, the information about the disease category of the person, if you're trying to categorize images, the information about the categories of the images, et cetera. That's all added up into this one variable here, x. Um, and the loss function is gonna take some data and it's then going to um, map from that data to a particular scalar value, c, uh, that tells you at this current time what the performance of your system is at this moment in time. So C is, is your measurement of the performance of the system on that particular data point. So when we talk about a learning algorithm then, um, so say we have some learning algorithm A and we've got some data set with M data points in it. What we're gonna get ultimately is a series of loss function values that 
tell us how well the algorithm is currently doing at categorizing or regressing or whatever on these particular data points. So we're going to call this CM, and this is our set of our loss function values on all of these um, different data points that we have. Um, oh, and then let's just note that this is going to be a stochastic variable because what happens in a machine learning algorithm, right, is that we start with random initializations in the parameters typically. And of course, you've also got, um, you know, just potentially some random associations in the data. Say there's going to be some randomness between the input variables to the regression and the output variables of the regression. So we can view this uh, cost function uh, as a stochastic variable. Um, and so we're going to be drawing this from distributions effectively. Um, so now we can ask, what is the expected value of obtaining a particular set of loss function values for a given algorithm A? A1, sorry. So let's say we have a specific algorithm A1 that we're interested in, and we want to ask, what is the uh, expected value of the loss functions for that algorithm? So that's just uh, given by this equation here, which is literally just the definition of expected value. So the expected value over cost functions. So what we're doing here is we are looking at the expectation with respect to the different uh, costs or loss functions, sorry. Um, you can, by the way, within machine learning, people refer to cost or loss functions interchangeably. So if you hear me say cost or loss, it, it means the same thing. Um, your, what we're asking is over, averaged over all the possible loss functions that we might provide an algorithm. What is the expected value of the uh, loss that we actually get given some data, uh, set of data of M points? Um, so this is the definition of expected value. So we're just taking the, uh, this is the probability of getting a particular uh, loss function value for M data points. And this is the probability of us having drawn that loss function as the loss function that we want to apply it to. So you can think of this as basically like, if I have an algorithm which stipulates how to update my parameters based on some data uh, and, and a loss function, then what I'm asking is, what is the probability that I'm going to apply this algorithm to this specific loss function? So what is the probability that I'm going to get up to some image categorization, or the probability that I'm going to do some regression, or the probability that I'm going to do some clustering, et cetera? Uh, and so what we're looking at here is averaged across all of the possible different tasks that we might apply an algorithm to, what is the probability of getting a particular loss function value? Um, now, so, so Blake, can I, yeah. can I ask you a quick question? Sure, yeah. This, this sounds like, uh, you know, usually in an expectation, you, you would have like uh, the second term that you, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the term probability of the, uh, you know, the cost, and it would usually be the value of the random variable. Like it would be like- Yeah, a, sorry, so- Maybe it would worth like pointing out a bit on that because that's a bit of a strange expectation in some ways. Um, yes, so well, so yeah, sorry. So let me uh, clarify that, JB. Thank you for asking me to do so. So notice that the random variable that I've got in the expectation here is actually the probability of getting a particular cost function value. So, so what we're actually looking at, I suppose I should have written this um, slightly different, what is the expected value of the probability of obtaining a particular set of loss function values for a given algorithm? So maybe in your notes, just insert that word there. So what is the expected value of obtaining a particular probability of a set of loss functions, uh, so loss function values? So that is the term in here. So we're looking at the expected probability of getting some cost function value CM. Um, and obviously we want to select the algorithm that is going to make the probability of low CMs as uh, high as possible. Um, so the, uh, this should actually be, yeah, let me see. Here we go. Yeah, okay. So, oops, my apologies. So what I should have said is that for, uh, for low CMs, we want uh, this to be as high as possible. I can send updated slides to clarify this, my apologies. 
Um, okay, so here's what Molpert and McReady actually proved. They proved that uh, if you have any two algorithms, A1 and A2, and you take the sum over loss functions of the probability of getting particular cost function values, these two things are completely equal, no matter which two algorithms you have. And what that means ultimately is that if we have a flat prior over loss functions, then there is no difference in the expected probability of obtaining particular cost values for any particular cost value and for any two sets of algorithms. And so what that means is that in expectation, no algorithm will perform better than any other algorithm if we have flat priors over our loss functions. That tells you that if you don't have any expectations about what task you're gonna apply your algorithms to, if you're remaining totally agnostic as to what sort of problem you're gonna apply your algorithm to, then you are going to never be able to actually have an algorithm that outperforms all other algorithms on average. All algorithms are gonna be equivalent to each other. Here's a way to visualize this uh, that is perhaps more intuitive. So what this tells us is that uh, there, this tells us there can be no general purpose algorithm that outperforms specialized algorithms because what it tells us is that, so here we've got on the x-axis types of problems. So this is basically equivalent to different loss functions. So each point on the x-axis here is supposed to represent like a different type of machine learning problem, like a regression or a clustering or a categorization, et cetera. And um, when we consider the performance of this algorithm, so some metric of how well it is able to get low loss function values, what the no free lunch theorem tells us is that the av no algorithm can be different on average, oops, excuse me, if we just take a flat average across all of the types of problems. So that tells us that if you have a, an algorithm that is roughly equally good on all problems, it's going to have basically a middling level performance on all problems. And in contrast, what you can also have is specialized algorithms that are very good at particular types of problems, but not so good at other types of problems. What you cannot have is an algorithm that is better than all other algorithms on all types of problems. They have to all fall to the same average. So it means you can only have really good performance with specialized algorithms. You cannot have really good performance with general purpose algorithms. When you move to a general purpose algorithm, you're necessarily going to sacrifice performance on some on, on your tasks. Okay, so this brings us to the topic of inductive biases. And by the way, for the, I, I think that one slide was unclear. I will send updated slides to JB to uh, help with that point. Um, okay. So this was the situation that researchers faced in the late 1990s um, and early 2000s effectively which is that they had the no free lunch theorem telling them that they couldn't have general purpose learning algorithms. But that was the you know, original dream, as I said. So the question then, once you're faced with this, is how do you select the right algorithms for AI or machine learning if you are presented with this no free lunch theorem? And uh, in a, a paper that first kind of laid out the case for deep learning in 2007 by Yashua Benjo and Yan Lacun, they identified three typical response categories to this question of how do we deal with the no free lunch theorem in machine learning? The first uh, is defeatism. And that's to say it's impossible, we're screwed. So basically, we're never gonna be able to develop general purpose algorithms that work. So we just need highly specialized algorithms. So what we're gonna do is for every specific task that you have, we're just gonna handcraft little features and little algorithms that do that specific thing. So let's say you want to identify faces. Don't bother trying to develop a general purpose algorithm for identifying things and images. Identify something that specifically looks for mouths and noses and eyes and ears, and that assembles those to determine whether or not they have a particular arrangement that's good for faces. 
And don't worry about if the system can't, you know, then recognize the difference between an apple and an orange or whatever. That doesn't matter. We're just going to handcraft it for these tiny little specific tasks. And that's how we'll move forward. And it's just the lot we have drawn in this world. Um, the other approach that they identified was denial to basically just ignore that issue. Uh, and that's something that was kind of the state of the field, as it were, in the early 2000s. Because there are a variety of tools that we have, which we know are universal function approximators, such as kernel machines. Um, and we have good bounds on the ability of these things to generalize in certain situations. And we'll talk a little bit about generalization and regularization in a second. Uh, so, you know, if we've got these algorithms that we know can approximate any function and we know they can generalize, what's the problem? We're just going to go ahead with things and ignore the Nokia lunch theorem. It probably just applies to some wacky cost functions that we don't care about. Um, but this is ultimately kind of sticking your head in the sand. The, the third uh, approach that ultimately Bengio and McCoon were pushing for in their paper, of course, um, is what they called optimism. And that is to say, well, look, all right, we don't want to handcraft everything. Like it's not useful for us if we have to manually build in every little function for every little system that we're building. Um, moreover, that might just be impractical on several levels. Uh, the, um, but the, the, the dream of the general purpose learning algorithm can't exist. We know that. So maybe what we should actually do is just define the set of things that we actually want to do with AI or with machine learning broadly and design systems that are general purpose within that restricted set. So rather than just say, okay, we're just going to do face processing, maybe what you should say is, okay, we're going to develop a system for recognizing things in images, period, because this is a broad class of tasks that we want to do. And so we want something that's general purpose within that class of tasks, but which is not so general purpose that it suffers from that flattening out that the no free lunch theorem tells us will happen. So what this requires is something called inductive biases. So an inductive bias is a set of assumptions that we ultimately bake into our algorithms about the sort of tasks that we will be performing. So they are a way of us endowing prior knowledge to our machine learning systems. A uh, fairly intuitive one, uh, an example that I give here, is that the world is organized into objects which are spatiotemporally constant. So for example, if you're trying to build a system to process images or videos, I should say, to process videos, one of the things you might want to assume, for example, is that there's some consistency frame to frame. Because generally speaking, objects don't magically disappear or appear. And you can build that assumption into your algorithm. And what it means is that if you ever apply the algorithm to a situation where objects aren't consistent, where things just appear and disappear randomly, it might give some weird results. But at the end of the day, it will perform better in these situations that are expected courtesy of that assumption that you bake in, because that makes it that highly specialized algorithm, or not highly specialized, but it makes it that specialized algorithm like we showed in the no free lunch plot. So Blake, we, we have a couple of questions. Can I just interrupt for yeah, a minute? Sure. Um, so I have a question about the face recognition. Uh, should we build uh, the algorithm specifically for recognizing noses, eyes, and so on, and combine everything? Or should we let the algorithm find its own way of solving for the problem for recognized face? So that's one. And the other one, which I think was uh, uh, quite interesting, is like the uh, a bit of a challenge on the you no know, free lunch theorem. Uh, I have an algorithm that uh, could have uh, all the specialized algorithms inside. What about saying, is that an algorithm that uh, is beating the free lunch theorem? Right. Uh, that second question is fantastic. I will return to it in a second. For the first question, um, well, this is what we're driving at here is that 
uh, you could, the, the, the approach that people were, that some researchers were following in the late 1990s, early 2000s, was to build these highly specialized modules. So say if you're building a facial recognition system, to build a system that is explicitly got built into it, like a template for what mouths look like, for example, and use that to try to identify mouths in the images, these sorts of approaches. The opposite end of the extreme is to say, we're not gonna specify anything about the nature of the task, we're just gonna provide data to the algorithm. What what Bengio and Lacoon were arguing for is actually something in the middle, a sort of Goldilocks approach, where you specify just enough for the algorithm to know something about the types of problems that it's going to be exposed to. So for example, if you are going to use the algorithm on face, on recognizing faces, develop an algorithm that's generally well suited towards learning features within images for the sake of identifying natural objects. And so don't specify a feature that looks for a nose, a feature that looks for a mouth. Have the system learn that, but design the system so that it's particularly well suited to these sorts of tasks, rather than trying to design an algorithm that could be applied to anything. Um, the second question. So the second question is a great question. This is uh, what uh, was raised in my uh, fourth year seminar or 500, year, uh, 500 level seminar course this year as well when I presented this. So yes, so one strategy might be to have a big set of specialized algorithms and basically to have then some director or mediator that decides which algorithm to apply to different situations. Um, and this is basically a way of getting around the no free lunch theorem to some extent. And indeed, it is probably the appropriate direction to go if you want to develop more and more general purpose artificial intelligence. Now, there's only one point of caution though. You still have that mediator. So you can't just assume that you're a mediator that determines which of the specialized algorithms to select from is also itself a perfect general purpose mediator. Because <laughs> the no free lunch theorem tells you that if you average across mediators, you're gonna get uh, with flat priors, you're still gonna get equal performance. So to some extent, what you also have to do then is think about broadly what, you, you still have to have some consideration of what types of mediation are gonna have to happen for your, for your algorithm. But I, I will say that I would argue, for example, that our own brains basically employ this strategy. So the no free lunch theorem applies equally to our own brains. We are not capable of being a general purpose learning algorithm. That's just not simply possible for us. So part of what we do in all likelihood is have separate modules within the brain that are well suited towards particular types of tasks. And part of what our brain also has are then additional mediator, you know, components that are mechanisms that help it to switch flexibly between these different modules. And indeed, we know that's what we see in the brain. Uh, you know, we, we will rely more or less on different systems depending upon the task that we're doing. And, you know, our cerebellum is good at a different set of computations than our thalamus is, whatever. So um, it's a great question. And indeed, that is roughly the approach that to some extent people are thinking of taking with AI more broadly nowadays is to, to have systems that um, are good at different things and that which can then cooperate together to achieve different purposes. Um, okay, so inductive biases. So uh, the, the point is though, you still have to think, I'll just end with this, even with that strategy, which can help you to get around no free lunch to some degree, you still have to think, as I said, about the nature of the mediation that you're gonna do. And of course, you have to think for each of your specialized modules about what sorts of tasks those are gonna be applied to. And one of the points of caution there is that, again, you probably don't want it to be too specialized. So even though, for example, our brains have, you know, specialized some degree of specialization in them, at the end of the day, they're also not completely specialized, right? You use the same visual processing areas effectively to process every 
object you see in your line of sight. Sometimes there are specific regions that take on a bit more computational load related to some specialties like face processing, for example. But at the end of the day, your primary visual cortex is still involved in processing a face as it is involved in processing, you know, a road or uh, letters that you're reading, whatever. So um, the, the point being that the approach of having different specialist algorithms is all well and good, but you still don't want to take that total defeatism approach of handcrafting each of those specialist algorithms too far. You want it to be that each of those algorithms is relatively flexible within a specific set of tasks. And to get there, you need inductive biases. You need to bake in assumptions about the nature of the tasks that these things will be doing. But the goal with inductive biases is to make them not too concrete. So let's talk about that now. So we can build inductive biases into machine learning algorithms um, in the following three ways. We can use hand-wired pre-processing of data for extracting certain predetermined features. Um, but as I was saying, this is you know, something which maybe you can do in cer certain circumstances, but which you don't necessarily want to do in all circumstances, right? So um, it's, it probably depends on how critical the particular features are and how much you can rest assured that they are there in the environment, in the task that you're doing. So if you've got a system that you know will only ever be applied to this very specific task, maybe it's not so bad to hand wire in a couple of features that it's expecting. But even then it can be difficult because the world's a messy place and you might not have exactly the features you're looking for. Um, you know, I think arguably the only times that it's really appropriate to have hand wired pre-processing of features is when something is just so critical to, to like have nailed that you don't even want to risk it. I mean, the example I think of is with um, mice, you know, we know that in, in various, not just mice, in various prey animals, there are circuits in their brain that are hardwired from birth to detect looming objects. So if there's some dark object that starts to get bigger over their visual field, these circuits just immediately detect that from birth. And that's probably a critical function for this system because obviously they need to avoid being eaten by big things descending on them. And so why bother mucking around with any kind of degree of general purposeness, just hand wire that stuff in via evolution. But generally for machine learning researchers, uh, we don't want to go too far down that path. The other approaches though that we can take to build in certain inductive biases are using specific architectures for our machine learning system. So by architecture, I mean the way in which you set up the flow of information, the way in which you define the mathematical functions so that you constrain the, the types of functions that can be approximated by the machine learning system. An example of this is convolutional architectures, which are used widely in deep learning nowadays. And convolutional architectures are great for building in an assumption about the translation invariance of objects in the visual field. The other thing you can do is you can specify specific loss functions. So remember I said this no free lunch theorem only applies if you assume a flat prior over loss functions. But if you assume a non-flat prior over loss functions, then the theorem doesn't apply. So what you can do is have specific loss functions in mind and design systems that work well with those loss functions. Um, and the other thing you can do then is have specific regularizers for applying to those loss functions as well, or they can be thought of as a part of the loss function really. Um, now, just a note on this, uh, a regularizer is just a way of preventing overfitting to data. And we're going to come back to overfitting um, more later. So I want to make sure that everyone's on the same page about what it is. So just a brief uh, tangent for a moment on overfitting. You may have already been presented with this concept and if so apologies but it's a very important concept so worst case scenario it just gets hammered into you. Uh, so when we talk about overfitting in modeling or machine learning what we're talking about is a situation where you allow your model to estimate a, its properties based on some of the peculiar complexities within the data that you received uh, as opposed to fitting a general purpose model that will actually apply to new data that you receive as well. So here's the example I gave. Let's just say we're doing a regression. So we've got uh, variable X and variable Y and we want to regress Y against X. Um, 
and we receive data points in blue here. Now, if you allow yourself to fit a very complicated polynomial, for example, you could fit the blue data perfectly with the line shown here. And it will have as low a possible value in mean squared error as can possibly be achieved. The difficulty is that when you now receive new data, it will likely not fit that model well at all, or rather the model will not, not fit the new data well at all. And that's because what you ended up doing was learning a model that was overfit to the peculiarities of the data that you had received. The approach that's typically taken in statistics, uh, which is kind of hammered into us from uh, an early phase in our uh, education, is that you want to adopt something like Occam's razor, which is that the simplest explanations are the best. And so what we should do instead is enforce simple models. So for example, rather than allowing ourselves to have a high degree polynomial, we force ourselves to do a linear model. So a you know, degree um, one polynomial. And uh, if we fit that to the blue data, we're not gonna get as low mean squared error uh, on our blue data as we did previously, but now we're gonna get better results with the new data that we get shown in green. Um, the analogy that I give sometimes to also help understand this is, you know, if you think about your visual system learning to recognize soccer balls, um, overfitting would be something like if you just stored in your brain an exact replica of every soccer ball you've ever seen, um, and that was what you tried to use to infer whether or not something was a soccer ball. The issue is that now if you see some new soccer ball that's a new set of colors, you're not gonna recognize it. Whereas if you develop some kind of internal model that's very simple that just says a soccer ball is this collection of hexagons and uh, uh, pentagons, then you will recognize new soccer balls even when it has, they have various odd decorations to them, et cetera. So, the, the hope is that these simpler, more abstract models will be better at generalizing, that's the key term, to new data points um, and will avoid overfitting to old data points. Now, that model, that enforcing of model simplicity that I mentioned, where you say, okay, you're only allowed to have like X, like a, a low order polynomial, um, other things you can do is you're only allowed to have, you know, so much strength in your regression parameters, et cetera. Uh, that approach, that's called regularization. So that's what regularization is. Regularization is a way of preventing your data from overfitting by enforcing constraints on the model's ability to fit the data in some way. And so it's effectively an additional term you add to your loss function that says, okay, we want you to say fit the data, but we also don't want you to use too many parameters or too big parameters, something like that. Um, so uh, that is an, an additional inductive bias you can build in because depending upon the assumptions about the sorts of models you're gonna have, you know, maybe you know, for example, that you sh will have a third order polynomial in this data. So you don't wanna assume a linear model in that case, you want to build in a third order polynomial. So there, there, this is an inductive bias that you can build into your systems. Okay, so let's say we want to be good optimists and we want to identify good inductive biases for artificial intelligence. What should those inductive biases be? Well, what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to define the set of problems that we're interested in for machine learning or artificial intelligence. Now, the history of artificial intelligence is interesting. Uh, and, you know, people don't always agree with me on this, but I will say the following. I view artificial intelligence as being the subset of computer science that is concerned with getting machines to do the sorts of things that people are good at. I say this because, look, all of computer science is concerned with getting computers to do intelligent things, helpful things. That, that, like literally, that there is no computer scientist that's not doing that, trying to get a computer to do useful things. So that's not what AI is. AI is specifically concerned with certain types of useful things. And what are those types of useful things? Well, as I mentioned, the history of AI is interesting in that if you go back and you look at the early phases, from the get-go, people identified AI as a being about trying to get machines to do what people do. You know, 
Alan Turing famously in an article back in 1950, an essay back in 1950, um, articulated this idea that, you know, really what we're, what we're after are machines that can imitate human beings. This is where he uh, came up with his Turing test idea for determining whether or not a machine is intelligent, but he's very careful to put uh, quotes around that. Um, anyway, so, so the, from the very origins of the field, the idea is that artificial intelligence is about getting machines to do the sorts of things that people can do. And Benju and Lacoon argued that AI should um, indeed continue down this path, in which case what it should do is take inspiration from brains. So when we look at our brains, and we've already discussed this a little bit um, in my response to that question, um, our brains are relatively general purpose. You can handle many different, you know, sensory motor tasks. You can learn to speak many different languages. You can learn to read many different scripts. You can learn to play many different games. But at the end of the day, you're also restricted in what you can learn. So you're very good at doing sensory motor tasks in 3D space and 4D space time with consistent motion of objects through space. You're not going to be able to handle whatever weird physics happens in some other dimension at all. And if we put you in a VR machine where the laws of physics don't apply, you're going to feel really like off kilter and not enjoy it at all. And it would take a huge amount of time for you to retrain on it. Um, similarly, if we think about your ability to, uh, you know, uh, read, like, you know, it took you a few years as a child to learn how to read, probably, uh, you know, maybe a million different exposures to the written word or something like that. Um, but uh, if you wanted to learn to read barcodes, maybe you could, I don't know, it's possible, but it would probably take longer than it would take you to learn how to read English or French. And the the point is that that's because our brains are wired with some inductive biases. We are not general purpose learning machines, far from it. So when people talk about general intelligence or artificial general intelligence, it's a bit of a misnomer because we don't have any reason to believe that artificial general intelligence can actually exist in the true sense of the word general. But what we do have is we have this machine, which is our brain, which is fairly general purpose. It can be applied to many different domains, but it is focused in on a set of tasks within the world that uh, humans are concerned with. And um, the idea is that that's what we should do with AI. So this gets to this concept called the AI set. This is the set of tasks that we want to design machine learning or AI systems to be good at. And the argument is that that set of tasks, so here if we consider the total set of different functions that could be learned by a computational system. Um, the idea is that the set of functions that we want AI to learn is gonna overlap very strongly with the set of functions that humans and some animals are good at. Now it's not gonna be total overlap. So, you know, we maybe don't care a huge amount whether or not our AI system is capable of identifying, um, you know, other potential Drosophila mates or something like that. But we do care that it can perform the basic kind of sensory motor integration that a Drosophila does to fly, for example. So this set of tasks that AI is good at, and, or that we want AI to be good at, I should say, is going to overlap significantly with what people and animals do. Um, so if we accept this logic, the idea is then that AI should not machine learning, and I'm using those words a bit interchangeably, which would drive certain AI researchers nuts for the record. To clarify one thing, artificial intelligence is a broader discipline than machine learning. Machine learning is one particular subset of artificial intelligence concerned with getting machines to learn from data. You can also have AI that is not concerned with learning necessarily, and that just tries to perform some of the tasks that people perform using, for example, hardwired logic systems. Um, but for me, I think learning is the most promising approach. So that's why sometimes I use the word semi interchangeably. But anyway, just to be aware of that. Um, so the, the argument, though, from this uh, perspective is that if uh, what we should be doing here is not trying to hand 
code any features because we don't want to be defeatist about it. So we don't want to sit down and make these specific modules that can only do one thing and one thing only. What we want instead is to define good inductive biases and the inductive biases we should identify are those inductive biases that will make computers good at the sorts of things that people are good at. So um, what sorts of inductive biases should we use for that? Well, the idea is that we should then look at the brain. We should look at what inductive biases the brain uses because the brain is our exemplar, our exemplar of a general purpose enough learning algorithm or system of learning algorithms. So an interim summary. Um, so the no free lunch theorem demonstrated that no general purpose learning algorithm can outperform specialist algorithms on average. And this means that we have to employ inductive biases in our systems in order to make them good at specific tasks. If we want top performance, if we're okay with at like so-so performance, then you can use general purpose learning algorithms and they, they will get you a lar large part of the way. But if you really want to maximize performance on a particular task, you have to build a specialist algorithm for that task. Um, and so uh, what uh, Benjo and Lacuna argued is that we don't want to make this too restrictive though. We don't want to handcraft everything down to these specific features for specific tasks. We want to have a system that can learn from data to identify the relevant features for the relevant task. But what we should do is define the set of tasks that we're interested in and build in inductive biases that make our systems good at those sets of tasks. And the set of tasks arguably that we're interested in are those tasks that humans and animals are actually pretty good at. Um, before I continue, are there any questions? Yeah, I was going to uh, ask you one. I think uh, this, uh, okay, so I have one on my own, <laughs> uh, yes. which is, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's this notion in neuroscience of a uh, uh, critical period. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, is there a, a, like an a, a equivalent or a parallel notion in some of the, uh, uh, in, uh, in the deep learning uh, machine? I mean, is, that, is that something that is, uh, of, of it I mean, has been looked at and, uh, and is of interest. Yeah, so definitely there is interest maybe, in understanding. Just Sorry. maybe for the, for, for the students, like a, a critical period is that period where you can learn, let's say, to differentiate two phonemes in, in you know, and then when you haven't done that uh, early enough in your, in, in, in your life, you actually can't learn it anymore. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, there's definitely interest in this because this is something that we see in these machine learning systems is that if you uh, go down the path of training a system on a particular set of tasks where say certain variables are unnecessary. So let's use the example you gave JB, which is the phonemes. It's a nice one. So to, to give a concrete uh, example of this, um, there are certain sounds in some languages that they, that, that uh, one language will differentiate between and another language will not. So um, the example that I'm familiar with from the literature is apparently, and if there are any Hindi speakers, uh, I apologize if I get this correct, incorrect rather, uh, apparently in Hindi, uh, there is a differentiation between a T sound or a D sound that you make off your uh, teeth and one that you make off the back of your mouth, basically. So like ta versus ka. I, I can't really do it. In English, we don't differentiate these sounds. So a T sound is a T sound regardless of where you're using your tongue to in, in make that T sound. And so what's interesting is they've done studies showing that um, English infants are actually capable of differentiating between those two sounds that are considered different in Hindi. But by the age of like 18 months, their English babies are not capable of differentiating those sounds, whereas of course Hindi babies still are. So part of what happens for uh, child learning is that they learn if they're surrounded by English people that it doesn't matter what, how the T sounds exactly, there's just this T sound that is generic. And then in learning that, their brain learns to start ignoring the distinctions between the different types of Ts. Um, and we see similar things with you know, machine learning systems and deep learning systems. If you train an a network on a particular task where particular variables aren't important, 
it will learn to ignore those variables. And now if you try to go and train, and so this is, gets back to the critical period point um, of JBs, you know, we see in people that it can then be hard later on to learn this stuff anew. Like it's very difficult as an English speaker to then go and learn those distinctions between those sounds in Hindi. Um, similarly with neural networks, it can be difficult to retrain them on this stuff to some extent. Though it depends on how plastic the system is. And if you allow the system to still change, you could retrain it. And so to get at your question, ultimately, JB, um, I think there is indeed some interest in there. There are sometimes just for engineering's sake, people come up with systems whereby you lower the learning rate over time. And so you prevent the system from continuing to update too much. You basically give it a base of knowledge that it learns rapidly early on, and then it tweaks things um, further along. I haven't seen anyone go down the path of really modeling the specific uh, critical periods that we see in people. And I think that's an interesting direction, potentially. And I have an, another question from a student. Uh, mm. So um, uh, some, uh, like a, uh, I read that uh, there are experimental clues indicating that deeper models tend to overfit less. Uh, seems to contradict yes. the idea of simpler model being more generalizable. That's a very interesting question. That is a fantastic question. And there is a slide coming up that's going to talk about exactly that. OK, so, so we'll wait for the, answer, the next yeah. slides. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, we should, uh, yeah, we'll uh, let you resume. Just make sure that uh, you have time for the rest of the talk. OK, sure. Um, OK, yeah, actually, wow, we've got a fair bit of space to go. So let me uh, maybe pick up the pace here a little bit. Um, Okay, so in the early 2000s, the most popular approach in machine learning was a set of approaches known as kernel machines. So kernel machines are probably best understood uh, via classification tasks. So let's say you have some data that you want to classify into two different categories. I know it could be dogs versus cats, whatever, it doesn't really matter. Um, you're ultimately, unless you have a very simple classification task, going to have what we call a non-linear class boundary. That is, within the space of data, the boundary between, say, cats and dogs is going to be um, a very complex function. Um, but, uh, you know, the issue is that one of the, you know, some of the earliest machine learning systems that were developed, such as, for example, the perceptron, one of the things that was great about these early systems is they were guaranteed to converge. They had convex loss functions uh, and they were guaranteed to, to converge and to get an answer. Um, and you can even then prove some nice principles about generalization and stuff like that, but they don't deal well with nonlinear class boundaries. So kernel machines were essentially a way of trying to get a combo of nice convergence properties but the ability to do nonlinear uh, class boundaries as well. Um, the basic idea was this, let's say you have some data, so we're trying to classify two classes shown in red and blue here. Um, you can project your data up into a high dimensional space where the data becomes linearly separable. And once you've done that, you then will have an easy optimization task with guarantees on convergence. Um, now, how do you pick what uh, projection to use here? You could hand wire these things uh, and then you'd be going down that defeatist path. The, the people who developed kernel machines wanted though a general purpose learning algorithm. So their idea was that what you could do is you could avoid hand pro, handcrafting pre-processing steps by actually using the data itself to do the projection. So, what they did is they define a series of kernel functions based on the data that you receive. This is, for example, how support vector machines work. So you, a kernel function is just a, a function that defines some relationship between uh, you know, two data points or two vectors here. And so what we do is we take uh, n data points uh, indexed here with i, and we're going to make our machine learning system basically this kernel function for each of the data points i applied to the data point x um, with some weights then uh, alpha i and this is how we're going to approximate the categorization um, and what's nice is you know the people who developed kernel machines were really smart people and they were much much better at math than uh, some of the people who do deep learning, to be honest with you. <laughs> uh, and the deep learning people would readily admit that. Um, 
no, I mean, some deep learning people are amazing at math for the record, but, but the, the kernel machine literature has some really beautiful mathematics behind it. In particular, there are some demonstrations that if certain mathematical properties are met by your kernels, such as one called Mercer's condition, which I linked to there for you, um, then you know that your kernel uh, is actually doing a dot product on some nonlinear function phi applied to your two data points. And if you have that and you know that, then what you end up getting is this for your function approximation. And this means that now you are doing a, a linear uh, function. Once you've applied this function phi, you've now got a linear task in front of you, which as I mentioned from the, the get-go with kernel machines is the goal is to make this a linear task where we've got guarantees on convergence. So uh, kernel machines, um, give you this guarantee on convergence. And they also have some really nice properties. Um, if you look at the work of uh, uh, Vladimir Vapnik, uh, they have really nice proofs about the nature of generalization in these machines as well. And a guarantee about you know, your ability to handle new data points as they come in. Um, so in many ways, kernel machines seem to be a wonderful approach because they have these guarantees on convergence, they have guarantees on generalization, uh, and so maybe they are, and, and they're, no, they're not handcrafting anything. So maybe they are your general purpose learning algorithm that you've been dreaming, dreaming of. But of, of course they can't be because the no free lunch theorem tells us this. Um, so what it turns out is that kernel machines are kind of like the blue line here. They are generally good at almost any task, but they're not super good at particular tasks. So they're not our red line, they're our blue line. Um, so if we want to do better on the AI set, we need to select some more inductive biases and move away from the approach taken by kernel machines, potentially. Uh, so what inductive biases do we want? Well, remember, the goal is to get a system that can do the kind of stuff that people can do and that can operate in the world that people operate in. That is this three-dimensional world that we live in with different complex arrangements of objects. And one of the central arguments in deep learning behind deep learning, I should say, is the idea that the world around us is ultimately compositional. And what I mean by that is when you look at any particular object in the world, it is composed of smaller pieces that are themselves composed of smaller pieces. And that if you break the objects or the worlds down into these smaller pieces, you will do a better job of recognizing these things. So, um, you know, when I was a student in art school many years ago, and they would get us, they were teaching us how to draw the human form. They would start us with these little wood figures and they would focus our attention on the fact that each of the components of the body was like a different, you know, geometric shape. And that they would say like, when you go to draw the human figure, don't just start drawing lines that match what you see, draw out each of the little components of their body, draw, you know, their, their, their forearm and their, uh, their biceps and their shoulders and so on and so forth and get each of those components in place and then the subcomponents as well and then you can fill out the picture. Um, and indeed this is what our brains seem to do when they process sensory stimuli. If we take images as an example, when we look at how uh, the brain works, early in visual processing what's going to happen is that your brain will identify certain very small little sub features of the visual image so for example oriented lines at different locations it will assemble those oriented lines at different locations into larger shapes um, through a series of processing steps um, so it's larger shapes and textures, and then it will start to assemble those larger shapes and textures into specific representations of different types of objects and eventually different abstract categories, faces versus dogs, for example. Um, so you have this hierarchical compositional processing that occurs in the brain in order to say, recognize the difference between a face or uh, of a human or a dog. So, if the world is best understood in terms of compositions of different pieces, then what we want is not a single linear projection into a new space like kernel machines do. Instead, what we want is multiple layers of nonlinear functions, each one operating 
with the features that were identified on the lower layers. And this is effectively an inductive bias. It is saying we assume that the tasks that we receive have hierarchies of features that are required for identifying in order to do the task. And as I said, this is what brains seem to do, right? So when we look at that, those processing stages, those map on to specific anatomical regions of the brain. This is a diagram of uh, the macaque visual system here. And um, as I mentioned, you know, we see parts of the macaque visual system early on that are doing these simple breakdown into oriented edges, parts that start to assemble those into slightly larger shapes, parts that assemble those into textures, and then areas where there are responses to abstract categories. And they're all working in this successive hierarchical manner. So the idea then is that what we need for machine learning systems is built-in hierarchy. We need deep architectures. It needs to be not that you do one projection and then some linear function. You need to have successive layers of processing to do your task, whatever it is, within the AI set. Okay, so making learning work in deep architectures. This is the challenge now. So how are you gonna train your system? Well, um, I don't know if you guys have gone over gradient descent yet. If not, I'll just briefly explain it. So one of the most successful approaches to training uh, deep architectures has been gradient descent. And the way that gradient descent works is relatively simple. If you have some set of parameters, which I'm calling W here on the x-axis, um, and you have some loss function on W, so the higher the loss function, the worse your performance is, you wanna minimize that loss function by finding the set of W that gives you the minimum on that loss. And one way you can do that is by calculating the gradient, or in a single dimension, the slope, of that loss function with respect to your parameters, W, and then just going down that gradient. So following the negative direction of what that gradient is. And if you do that with tiny little steps, you will be guaranteed to eventually arrive at a minimum of the function. Now you have to be careful that you take small steps um, because if you take too big a step, say you'll jump across these, these big gaps. Um, but with small steps, sufficiently small steps, you're guaranteed to reach a local minimum with gradient descent. And so any algorithm for which you can, sorry, any, pro any, yeah, any model for which you can calculate gradients, so any model that is differentiable, you can apply this to. So it's a very general purpose strategy for training a system. It's what, frankly, regression does. You may or may not be aware of that, but like if you're performing, um, you know, a regression on a task, uh, if you actually do it in small steps, you're just performing gradient descent on your mean squared error loss function. Um, so here's an example of what that would look like in a deep architecture neural network. So here's just a little bit of the math. So the idea is that at each step, what we're gonna do is, as I said, have a composition of nonlinear functions. So in the case, and what we usually do with the neural networks, is we have a linear function followed by a nonlinear function, and we do successive stages of linear sum of the inputs with our parameters w followed by a nonlinear function f, and then you the next stage takes the nonlinear outputs from the previous stage and does the same operation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, from your input to your output. And then uh, to update the parameters, what we do is gradient descent. We calculate the so here e is our loss function. We calculate the partial derivative of the loss function with respect to all of the parameters. We do that using the chain rule, and I'm not going to run through the math here. As I said, there's lots of online tutorials about this. I just want to give you the broad level overview. But so we're going to um, calculate our derivatives uh, of our errors or our loss function and use those to update the parameters throughout the um, network. And this can work as long as your network is differentiable. You can do this theoretically for any network architecture that you have, including very deep ones. So theoretically, this is a great way to train up a deep, deep architecture. Um, now, it should be said, back in the early 2000s, it was thought that gradient descent would be unworkable for deep neural networks. 
And um, the reason was, well, there were, there were a few reasons. And so let me tell you about those. So the first one is the vanishing gradients problem. So one of the things that happens in a deep architecture is that with each successive nonlinearity, so if I go back to this network for a moment, every time you apply one of these nonlinearities, the derivative of this function, the function that is the entire network, with respect to these parameters can get bent, like can get stretched out or shrunk down by those nonlinearities. And what that means then is that if you take these derivatives successively through multiple layers, you get more and more of this stretching and shrinking. And that leads the derivatives, the gradients that you get for early phases of the network to often basically just disappear into nothing or ultimately, or alternatively to explode into something else. Typically what happens though is they disappear um, if you take a standard neural network architecture. So this is a plot here of the norm of the gradient for uh, a given neural network architecture with 10 layers over multiple iterations of training. And it's just showing that, you know, um, basically the, the size of the gradient that you get um, is much larger in the higher parts of the layer and uh, higher parts of the network and, and much lower in the lower parts of the network. And this can sometimes, um, it was thought, prevent you from being able to uh, train up a really deep architecture. Um, the second issue is potentially the issue of local minima. So as I mentioned to you, the gradient descent algorithm is guaranteed to converge to a minimum, but it is not guaranteed to get the global minimum. If you follow the slope of some function and you never go in a direction opposing uh, up the gradient, then you're going to get stuck in a local minimum and potentially and um, never make your way to the global minimum. Um, and finally, there's overfitting. It was thought that if you just stacked many nonlinear functions one on top of another, you're basically just generating, you know, uh, insanely high or high degree polynomial, in which case you are 100% guaranteed to overfit your data. So good luck. Um, and it was thought that this was basically going to prevent deep architectures from ever generalizing well. Um, and indeed, there were no, unlike with kernel machines, there were no guarantees on the generalization of these uh, algorithms. So people thought, well, surely they're just going to overfit the data if you build a really deep architecture. Um, so as a result, deep learning was kind of dead in the water. Um, but what happened effectively is that uh, in the late 2000s and then over the last decade, people have realized that in the right circumstances, none of these things are actually a problem. And there are several unintuitive results this way, um, but uh, effectively gradient descent in deep neural networks can actually work really well. So why is that? Well, the first thing is that one of the things we've come to learn is that size matters for deep neural networks. So here, what you're looking at is a plot of um, the number of, uh, uh, G ops, so the number of like literally like operations that the computer performs in order to uh, train up a particular model. Um, and that's obviously going to scale with the, the size of the network uh, to some extent, but it'll also train uh, scale with the amount of time you have to train it for. So the circles here represent the actual size of these different networks. Um, the number of parameters. So the biggest circles are 155 million parameters. And just think about that for a second. Like typically when you perform a regression in science, you're working with like two, three, maybe 10 parameters. We're talking about models here with 155 million parameters. And um, interestingly, what people observed over the last decade is that the more parameters you add, the better things get. You just get better accuracy on these tasks. And now there seems to be maybe diminishing returns at this point in time. You can see that curve is falling off, but there was a period in the early phase where essentially, um, you know, as they, now they were also able to squeeze some better performance out of smaller models, but um, the, the big models uh, shown here and also trained for a long time. So not just big in terms of the size of the network, but also big in terms of how much data you have and how long you train it on. Um, you get better performance. Now, now, why would this be? 
Well, so it's this, this gets back to the question that was asked uh, at the interim summary a moment ago. Um, it turns out that that original story from classical statistics that you want to find simple models by restricting the number of parameters that you can have is wrong. And it's wrong in ways that we don't fully understand. So the standard story from um, uh, classical statistics is basically that, so here we're plotting the ratio of test over training error. So when you're, when you're overfitting, you're gonna get very low training error because this we're talking about the error on the data sets that you trained on. So on your old data, you're gonna get very low error, for example, very low mean squared error. Um, but when you now apply your model to new data points, it's going to do poorly, and that's your test data points. So um, effectively, uh, you're going to get a very high error on your test data relative to the training error. Um, and so the higher up this plot is, the, the worse things are. And so the standard story from classical statistics is that basically the ratio of testing error to training error should go up as you increase the number of parameters. Um, some of the experience with neural networks in the early phase led people to think that maybe you've got this funny situation where it's actually the inverse to classical statistics. And it's actually just that the bigger the model is, the better things are. And the answer is that it's something more complex and it's something called double descent. So what we find, weirdly enough, is that as you increase the number of parameters, things get better in terms of your ability to generalize. And then you go through this period where things get worse again in a manner that almost matches what people expected from classical statistics. And this is what people would sometimes see in the late 1990s when they trained slightly bigger neural networks is they'd see worse overfitting as they increased the depth of the network. Um, and that seemed to match their intuitions from classical statistics. But then what happens, weirdly enough, is as you increase the model more and more and more in terms of the number of parameters it has, here this is just the width of ResNet, for example, the generalization actually starts to get better and better again. And um, you have this weird situation where you can actually have models that have literally many orders of magnitude more parameters than you have data points. And uh, they generalize better than simple models with few parameters. Now, why is that? The honest answer is that this is an entire area of research that people are still exploring. Um, and it's one of the things that sometimes drives certain personality types nuts with deep learning is what typically happens is people will try something out, it turns out to work really well, and they'll just go for it, even though they don't have a sound mathematical justification for why it is. And that's kind of where we're at with the double descent phenomenon to some extent. Though, for the record, some people have worked out some initial ideas on this related to how gradient descent performs and how it generalizes in these very, very over-parameterized regimes. Um, and so you can go and look at this, but it's, it's too much for today to cover. But basically, um, the the intuition that I can give you is just that it's almost as if what happens when you increase the, the model size, the, the number of parameters to a huge, huge degree is that it's like you're allowing the model to make many, many, many different sub models and then average out across them. And so it's, it's almost like you're, you're democratizing the entire model building process and you end up getting this sort of like more Bayesian approach almost to your um, modeling. Though it's not technically Bayesian. It's, it, it's like you've averaged out across many different models and, and that's maybe one of the reasons it works. But there's also um, interesting things regarding the learning that happens in these over-parameterized models. Uh, and that comes to this point, saddle points. So as I mentioned, uh, so people were worried about generalization. They were also worried about local minima. Uh, so what's interesting is that it turns out that local minima are not really a problem in big networks. Uh, the reason is actually relatively easy to understand from an intuitive perspective. When you talk about a local minima or a local maxima, what you need is that all of the dimensions for that function agree that that point is a minima or a maxima. So here in two dimensions, you have to have both this dimension and this dimension sat coming down to a minimum at that point in order for it to be a local minimum. 
If instead you have it that it's a local minimum for one dimension and not for the other, you get something called a saddle point, where it is a minimum for one dimension, but potentially a maximum for another dimension, for example. And um, if you think about it for a moment, if you've got 100 million parameters in your model, what are the chances that you're going to have a local minimum somewhere? To get a proper local minimum, you need all 100 million parameters to agree that that's a minimum point. It's actually very hard to find such points in any function. And the only places you tend to find such points are actually the global minimum or very close to the global minimum. Instead, what the landscape is riddled with is these saddle points. And it turns out that many times where people thought deep neural networks early on in the early 2000s, where they thought they were getting trapped in local minima, what was actually happening is they were getting trapped in saddle points because technically the gradient is zero at this saddle point. So the, low, the algorithm can get trapped there, but there are relatively easy tricks. There's this algorithm, for example, called Adam, which is just a slight modification to gradient descent, which gets it out of saddle points. And if you add these little tricks to escape saddle points, now, gradient descent in a really big network works really well because the only point at which you're going to actually hit a local minima is when you're actually pretty close to the global minima. Um, there are additional things that can help. Um, so uh, I mentioned escaping saddle points. Uh, the other thing is you can get around vanishing gradients by choosing appropriate nonlinear functions. So for example, another thing that really helped was the introduction of the ReLU function. This is the rectified linear unit. Uh, these are basically just uh, nonlinearities that consist of setting a hard threshold where you say the function is zero if it's below, uh, if the input is below zero and just equal to the input a linear function if it's above zero. Um, and this helps because it prevents you from having a lot of squishing and pulling of your gradients and that, that uh, prevents vanishing gradients to some extent. And then, of course, if you're still potentially getting some overfitting once in a while, though, as I said, this seems to be less of an issue in really big networks, you can use various regularization schemes and some like dropout uh, that were developed also seem to help with these generalization properties. So where we stand today is that um, People basically over the last decade kept pushing deeper and deeper architectures and figuring out these tricks and realizing that bigger networks with bigger data basically just worked better and better and better. Um, and we're now at the point where there have been real breakthroughs in a variety of tasks and in particular those tasks that people are good at. Perception, communication, motor control, things that require multiple constraints being satisfied in a hierarchical manner. And, and deep architectures seem to have really helped on such tasks, um, especially when you have big models and lots of data. So, you know, here's an example of what you can do with a deep neural network nowadays. You can give it data that consists of images paired with descriptions of the images, and you can train the neural network to generate descriptions of the images, and it will do quite a good job. So here, um, you know, you show it this image and it says a woman is throwing a Frisbee in a park. And then what you're showing here is just this funny little attention mechanism that the uh, network has. But um, so it was attending to the Frisbee when it said that, but I'm not gonna go into that. You can read this paper, uh, which will also, I gave you this in the materials. It cites the original research paper that develops this and you can learn how they do this. But the point is that um, really deep architectures can do tasks like this quite well, actually. Um, so, all right. Turns out a lot of the concerns that people had in the late 1990s and early 2000s are not actually big issues, especially once you have enough co computational power. And that's one of the interesting things about this story, right, is that effectively, the, because we didn't have mathematical proofs, people didn't know what was actually going to be the performance of these things. And their intuitions told them that they should perform a certain way and have certain failings. And then the only thing that got us around those intuitions was trying it with really large amounts of compute. So the savior of deep learning was effectively just Moore's law and, and also the development of GPUs, the ability to do huge amounts of operations um, in our computers. So should you use deep learning? Because it works really well, I've said, I've been trumpeting it here. Um, the answer is not necessarily. So it's important to realize that deep learning has very specific 
points where it's the right application and specific points where it's not the right application. Uh, so the question you should ask yourself if you're conducting some research and you're trying to decide whether or not to use deep learning is um, first and foremost, is this a task that involves hierarchy and in particular nonlinear hierarchy? So do you have any reason to believe that in order to solve the task that you're solving, it's gonna require something that composes smaller, simple features into medium-sized features, into larger features in nonlinear ways. If that's the nature of the task you're doing, deep learning is probably the right way to go. If you don't think that's the task or the nature of the task, deep learning is not the right way to go. The, the deep learning is about using this inductive hierarchy that's very inductive bias of hierarchy. That is its raison d'etre. And so if you have, uh, you know, a system like language processing where it's clearly a hierarchy, right? Like words are composed of phonemes, which get assembled into words, which then get assembled into sentences, which then get assembled into larger thoughts. Language processing is necessarily hierarchical. And lo and behold, deep learning has blown other previous attempts at natural language processing out of the water because it's the right inductive bias for natural language processing. But if you have a task where you don't have that hierarchy, pff, why would you be applying this inductive bias to the task? It's, it's just gonna trip you up. The second issue is the computational resources you have. So as I mentioned, all these concerns about deep learning, they, they kind of disappear when you get to the really over-parameterized, really large data regimes. They still exist for small networks and small data sets. If you have a small data set and you've only got limited compute, deep neural networks can still overfit things, no problem. And you can still get local minima that trap you. Uh, it's you know, really a, a real issue. So, so you have to ask yourself, how big is my data? How much compute do I have? You know, if you're not Google, uh, and you can't build a model with uh, you know, 10 million parameters, let alone 100 million parameters, um, stop and ask yourself where you're actually gonna go with this thing. Now, you don't need to get to quite that size necessarily for your purposes, but just it's something to be aware of. And then the other thing you can ask yourself though is are there any other data sets that you could use to pre-train your model? Because you need a lot of data to really do well in these tasks. Um, and to get around some of the generalization issues that happen as well. Uh, but one approach that you can sometimes take is if you have a related data set that does have a lot of data and you can pre-train on that on some related task and then retrain the model on your specific task with a smaller amount of data, that can work very well. But if you don't have that situation and you're just training off a small amount of data from the get-go, deep learning is not gonna be the right approach for you. So let me give you some concrete examples of, of this. So here's an example from a paper that uh, um, was put out by, I, I'm a co-author on it. I played a small part in this, but it was ultimately led by uh, Daniel Bozak uh, here, who's here now at McGill and his colleagues. Um, so what we did is uh, we examined the ability of different machine learning methods to work on various problems as a function of the model size uh, and the, the data size, I should say. Um, so we examined some of the classic machine learning tasks like image recognition on digits. This is the MNIST data set or fashion MNIST, which is where you recognize shirts versus pants, et cetera. And we know deep learning can work well in this sort of hierarchical image processing. And then we also took a situation where we applied it to brain scans and we looked at the volumes of different brains, their connectivity, various slices of brains, et cetera. And we asked how can, well can we predict things like age or gender or disease status, et cetera. Um, and we did this with a very large data set from the UK Biobank, large within the world of MRI. Uh, and not within the world of deep learning. And so we're gonna come back to that in a moment. Um, and we examined various models abilities to do these tasks as a function of the number of data points given to the models. So we not only examined uh, deep neural networks, which you see here, but we looked at various kernel machines and um, basic uh, regression and linear techniques. And what did we find? Well, we found that 
um, as expected on the classical image processing things where you're trying to recognize handwritten digits, for example, or different categories of fashion, deep neural networks perform the best. They were most able to capture, uh, you know, the functions with very large data sets. Um, and it was definitely the way to go. But when we looked at our ability to categorize various biomarkers based on MRI data, they didn't do any better than the linear or kernel-based systems. And part of the issue might be just the number of data points. So we're not even getting, you know, a tailing off here of the, uh, of the functions, which suggests that we're not at quite enough data points, period. And that's probably part of what's going on. Maybe deep learning would do even better on these tasks if we had even more data points. Because typically, you know, you want on the order of tens of thousands or even millions of data points for a deep learning system rather than just thousands. Or even, you know, as the case is often with MRI data, dozens. Like it's just, that's gonna be hopeless unless you have data that you can pre-train on. Um, the other issue though is that there's probably just not hierarchy involved in this, right? Like if you are trying to categorize the age of a brain, there are a variety of features that you can maybe identify in a structural MRI. Um, but it's not like they compose into this hierarchical system that determines the age of the brain. It's not like, well, if this features in the prefrontal cortex and this features in the visual cortex, then the person's old. But if this features in prefrontal cortex, but this features in auditory cortex, then the person's young. It's not like that. There's just a general atrophy across the brain, say, uh, which I can attest to as I get older, that you're gonna see, and it's not gonna be built in this hierarchical way. So you don't need a hierarchy of nonlinear functions to identify this stuff. So why are you, would you apply deep learning? It's not gonna perform better, which is indeed what we see. Um, but an example of where deep learning has worked really well recently in neuroscience research is this. Um, this is deep lab cut. So this is a system that Mackenzie Mattis developed uh, for behavioral tracking in neuroscience experiments. Um, so what it does is you give it a movie, say of a mouse or a fly or whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, and you get it to learn to identify uh, various parts of the bodies of the animal um, in space. So say with the mouse here, if you wanna track its reaching behavior because you're doing motor control studies, um, Deep Lab Cut is a neural network that will be able to identify the fingers uh, on the mouse so that you can track its reaching behavior. Now, a neuroscience lab is not gonna have millions of videos of mice reaching that have been labeled by a human being saying here are their fingers like they they probably wouldn't even have millions of videos though they might have a lot but labeling that with many different um you know labels of the fingers is going to be just a nightmare but what you can do with deep lab cut and this is where it comes in is there are just many images you know of mice for example out there are millions of images and so what you can do instead is you can pre-train uh, your network on, say, just natural images that look like the sorts of images you're going to apply to here. And this is what they did. They pre-trained it on this ImageNet data set. And then they took the pre-trained model, and you can take the pre-trained model and use a small number of data sets for your specific task, say, of identifying, you know, mouse hand positions, and the model will be able to learn it because it's been pre-trained on millions of data points. And this works really well. And Deep Lab Cut is now used widely across neuroscience for behavioral identification of animals. Um, so it, it is possible to do this in, in the life sciences, but you need a good uh, pre-training data set. So the, the moral of our story here uh, to wrap up is um, that deep learning is a very powerful tool, uh, but it is ultimately a tool that is designed to operate on the AI set i.e. the set of tasks that humans and animals are good at. So note that like you uh, are probably, you would know, have no problem identifying a mouse's hand. This is the kind of thing that you could do well. And lo and behold, deep learning systems are good at it. Uh, the reason that they work is ultimately because they use this inductive bias of hierarchy. So if you have tasks that you think involve hierarchies of nonlinear features, deep learning is the way to go. Um, and it's particularly effective when you have a big model and lots of data, or alternatively, a big data set that you can pre-train on that has some of the same statistics as the data set that you're ultimately interested in applying it to. You shouldn't use deep learning if you don't have any reason to believe that the problem contains a hierarchical solution. If 
if you don't know whether it has a hierarchical solution, you can try deep learning, but just, you know, the, you should put some thought into this. Ask yourself whether the problem you're doing actually has it. So for example, deep learning has worked well in genomics to some extent because there are probably hierarchical setups there, right? Like depending upon how different genes combine, you will get different results. And so indeed, it's helpful to apply deep learning to that situation. But if you're, say, just trying to categorize, um, I don't know, different disease states based on some initial biomarkers, maybe it's not hierarchical. Maybe there's just a basic linear or relatively simple nonlinear function that can describe it. The other thing, of course, is ask yourself about your computational resources and the size of your data set. And if you have a small data set, figure out if you have a different data set that you can pre-train on that should have on the order of tens of thousands or even millions of data points, ideally. If you don't, it's going to be tough to apply deep learning potentially. You might get some results, but it, it's not guaranteed. The best situation is when you have a really big data set or a really big pre-trained data set. So if you're unsure about the nature of your problem or you have limited data, I would say generally your best bet is to use other techniques, linear mo models or kernel methods, because they are the general purpose, you know, Swiss army knife of machine learning. They do a really decent job at everything. And uh, so when you're not sure what your, what your problem is and whether it's hierarchical and you don't necessarily have a huge amount of data, use these tools. You've got guarantees on the generalization. You are going to get nice guarantees on convergence. It'll work out of the box for you. Um, use deep learning when you really think you're doing something from the AI set. It is designed as a Goldilocks approach to machine learning for the sake of learning on the AI set. And so it works well with these hierarchical problems with tons of data, but it's not a magic technique for analyzing data. It has specific applications for which it's great. So just keep that in mind when you yourself are getting up to your research. And that's it for today. I'm happy to field just a few questions before I head. Thank you so much, Blake. That was uh, fantastic. Uh, you know, the fact that you, we had uh, so many questions and uh, we're a bit late is uh, a testament of the interest and the, uh, uh, yeah, I think, I think it was, this was both like uh, giving us some very deep insights uh, no pun intended, and also some uh, very good practical uh, 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 advice. So, uh, like, uh, this is this was uh, this is perfect. Uh, thank Good. you. So, much. so maybe we have time for maybe one question before we break for um, ten minutes. Uh, let me check what is the uh, if there is a key question that we should uh, answer right now. And uh, please, uh, other instructors, uh, chiming if you want. Um, so, uh, so many questions that are left because of the uh, time constraints. <laughs> yeah, my apologies, I didn't. Uh, no, that's fine. That's fine. So it was. Uh, it's uh, you know, it's, it was supposed to be a bit interactive, and that's uh, that's what uh, it should be. Um, so let's say I have a lot of computational resource, but I need to train algorithm to run uh, really quickly without much computational power. Is there is there a way to use deep learning? And my guess is probably not. Um, the, the one thing I'll say about that, yeah, is uh, if you've got a huge data set, but you don't have a lot of compute available, um, there are resources within many institutions. Like, so for example, here in Canada, there's this Compute Canada resource where you can get access to GPU clusters uh, if your institution buys in, for example. And so like McGill and Mila buy into this. And there's usually ways uh, to get some access to Compute Canada resources as a researcher in Canada, for example. So if you've got a large data set and you don't have the compute, there may be solutions for you. There's one question that I can put quickly, which is on the interpretation of the parameters uh, mm -hmm. aspect, which is a classic question. So maybe that's worth uh, uh, summarizing your thought on, on, on this. Uh, so why we get the double descent phenomenon? No, no, sorry. The interpretation of, uh, so the question is, uh, you know, some, we have like a, in biology, we have parameters that we're interested in uh, and, uh, you know, and the, uh, and so. Oh, is, I see. Is, like the interpretation yeah. of the model. Of the model. Yes, correct. So. Yes. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, this is another thing I suppose I could have put in here as a sort of when not to use deep learning question. Um, if you are really trying to use your model to get at, like, say, you know, what is the impact of this parameter on this outcome, 
it's easier to interpret it if you build a basic regression model, for example. Now, there are ways to do this in deep learning to some extent. So there are ways to identify uh, the variables that drive some of the decisions that a deep neural network makes, but they're not always easy. There's basically techniques that have been developed to do this stuff. Um, so it's possible, uh, you know, and uh, you can look at uh, like the uh, inception network and deep dream and stuff like that for some of the ways that people approach this. Um, and there's a whole host of uh, research into interpretable AI. So I think that, that, that ultimately we will kind of get around that to some degree, but it's still a reality that if, if interpretability of your model is absolutely quintessential for you, then you, know, you maybe also want to consider using a regression technique, say, rather than a, like a standard regression model rather than a deep learning.